To me, his 148th P51 Mustang kits have been around for a while, but they still remain some of the best Mustang kits out there. With excellent engineering, great surface finish, and ease of construction, they provide the modeler with excellent value for the money. I think these are great entry-level kits given their low parts count and excellent fit. But that being said, they can be detailed to a very high standard for those wishing to do a little more than just build straight out of the box. By using some advanced finishing techniques, you can create a very fine representation of this historic P51 Mustang. Welcome back to Flying S Models. Thanks for tuning back into the channel for this full build video of Tamiya's 148th P51C Mustang. Tamiya's boxing sports some really nice box art. The kit has markings for three distinct aircraft, including Gentile's famous Shangri-La markings that are shown on the box top. While I really like those markings, I wanted to do something a little different here. And as far as Mustangs go, the markings carried by the RAAF flying out of Italy in 1944 and 45 are pretty unique. With the British style camo and blue nose and tail, these Mustangs were unique indeed. The layout and engineering is typical to Mia, with minimal parts count and fine surface detail. I actually started painting some of the interior parts of the kit before I began composing videos for the channel. You can see some of the interior colors that I had sprayed and how they highlight the great sidewall details of the kit. I had also done a little work on the cockpit seat, adding some scratch-built belts and buckles from pewter foil and fine solder wire. I've got a video loaded up here on the channel if you want to check out that technique later. I wasn't really happy with the colors though, as I felt that they were a little too pale for the interior green I wanted to display. So I decided to come back with a different interior green, this time from a 50-50 mix of Tamiya flat green and yellow zinc chromate. I sprayed the cockpit sidewalls, the cockpit floor, and seat with that new mixture. Just a light coat or so to not completely cover the dark wash that I had applied when I first started the build. I sprayed the wheel bays, gear covers, and other interior sections with the same interior green mix. But for those, I came back over with several different colors and shades to represent the yellow zinc chromate that was used in the interior sections apart from the cockpit itself. To add more interest to the cockpit and wheel bays, I came back over the flat paint and applied a coat of white spirits, followed by an application of various shades of oil paints applied straight out of the tube. You can see a more detailed video of that technique and the results that can be achieved in a previous video I have up here on the channel. The basic premise is that the oils will work into the flat paint as you apply them over the white spirits and then use clean white spirits to remove the amount of excess that suits your weathering needs. For these cockpit parts, I used a combination of raw umber, yellow ochre, and white, but you can use whatever colors you desire and that makes sense for the shading you want to achieve on the base color. Now using Vallejo paints and a fine tip brush, it's time to paint some of the structural high spots on the cockpit areas, as well as to add the details to the consoles, control boxes, instruments and switches, as well as levers and gauges. I mix up a lighter shade of interior green using Vallejo Russian uniform green and flat yellow. I like it to be a good bit lighter than the base coat of the interior green to create contrast. While it may look a little overdone when you are looking at it at this point, it will really help bring out those details when the fuselage sides are closed up. I add a little more yellow to the mix when I go to paint the details on the wheelbase so that there is contrast against the yellow zinc chromate. With the wheel wells complete, that part can be added to the bottom wing section and glued into place with Tamiya Super Thin Cement. The upper wing halves can be glued into place and allowed to dry while we finish up the fuselage painting. To paint the cockpit details, I start with Vallejo's flat black 
and carefully paint all of the cockpit sidewall detail appropriately. You can see that I like to use leftover plastic water bottle caps for my paint mixing. They're great for mixing small amounts of paint. They don't dry the paint out and I just toss them after I use them. I painted the seat in the same way, using light gray for the belts and leather brown for the headrest. For the fuel tank, I used a little neutral gray to dry brush the corners and add more detail and interest. The key here is to wipe off nearly all of the excess paint using a clean paper towel, then lightly brushing the corners and high spots of any feature that you're trying to accentuate. Various cockpit switches and levers were picked out using grays, white, and red. The Tamiya instrument panel does not include any raised detail for the gauges. I didn't want to use the decal sheet provided as I never get convincing results when I go that route. Instead, I just use a fine tipped brush and paint some representative instrument gauges onto the panel using Vallejo White. To add an even better appearance to the instrument panel, I use a little 5 minute epoxy applied to each instrument gauge with a toothpick to simulate the instrument bezels. It's a touch over scale, but when viewed from the outside, the results are pretty convincing. While I was waiting for the epoxy to cure, I gave the landing gear and wheels a coat of Tamiya flat aluminum, and then followed that up with a dark oil wash to bring out the details in the wheel and landing gear. For this, I use a combination of lamp black and raw umber thinned with mineral spirits. With the cockpit painting complete and the instrument panel gauges cured, I could assemble everything and install all of the parts into the fuselage halves. I installed the cockpit assembly as well as the ventral intake screen and radiator, having already painted and weathered those when I was doing the landing gear and wheels. The fit of the parts is excellent and the fuselage halves virtually snap into place. With the fuselage complete, I added the previously completed wing assembly. Again, the fit here is excellent. After the wing, I add the top fuselage cow cover and then add the tail planes. They are handed and Tamiya has molded them so that they can only be installed in the appropriate left and right hand positions. When everything is dried, I come back in with my 400 grit sanding pad and sand all of the seams. This allowed me to see a few areas that needed just a little filler. For this, I used to me a super fine white putty. It goes on easily, dries quickly, and sands smoothly. There is one pesky seam on the Tamiya kit that is virtually impossible to fill and sand smooth. It's the small exhaust duct just behind the radiator assembly. Rather than try to fill and sand it, I just cut a thin piece of plastic card in the shape of the duct and glue it in place to hide that seam. With the major assemblies complete, it's time to get some color down on the model. I start with my usual method of putting some pre-shading on the panel lines. For this, I use Tomito's NATO Black. I work my way around the entire model, applying a light coat to all of the panel lines in order to give some extra dimension to the top coat colors once they are applied. 
For those top colors, I used a combination of Tamiya and AK Real Color acrylics. I start by painting the lightest shade first, which in this case is the undersurface light gray. After I complete the base color, I thin the light gray with extra thinner and add a little white to lighten things up. I come back in and spray some light coats inside of each panel area to add more depth and dimension to the finish. You can see the final result is a well-weathered and faded look. I started painting the ocean gray to the upper surfaces when I ran into a big problem. For those watching the video up to this point, you were probably already scratching your head wondering when I was going to modify that tail. Well, this was obviously a real duh moment for me. I failed to take note that the RAAF Mustang had the filleted tail and I had not made the appropriate modifications. As I said before, there are always hiccups in any project and I guess this one was not going to be any exception. I debated just doing a different version, but I really wanted this particular one so I simply took out a spare Tamiya P51D kit I had that had that filleted tail and hacked those parts off. I then cut off the completed tail from my model and grafted the new filleted tail in place. While the fit wasn't perfect, it was really close. To fair everything in, I used some super glue and acrylic dental resin powder to make sure that I not only had a secure joint, but that I could blend in the fuselage to tail joint. If you want to find out more about that filler, you can check out a previous video that I have loaded up here on the channel. Obviously, with all that sanding, some of the surface detail was removed, primarily a few of the distinct panel lines. To put those back, I cut strips of Dymo labeling tape and used a small pin chucked up into a pin vise to rescribe those lost lines. After sanding those smooth, I cleaned them out again with the pin vise and then applied a little Tamiya Super Thin Cement to even out the panel lines. Now that I had that hiccup behind me, I could get back to adding the primary colors. I had to add the pre-shading to the new tail, and then I got back to spraying the ocean gray camo pattern. Just as I had done with the undersurfaces, I lightened up the ocean gray with a little flat white and sprayed that mixture inside of each panel. For the RAF dark green, I used AK Real Colors. Instead of using white though, I lightened it up for the post shading by using a little AK Tan. Using Tamiya tape, I masked off the fuselage tail band and painted that using Tamiya sky color. In the same way, I masked off the wing and tail ID stripes and painted those using Tamiya Flat White. For the yellow leading edge bands, I first sprayed a coat of flat white as the yellow has a tough time covering the darker colors. 
I followed that up with a light coat of Tamiya Flat Yellow. In the same way, I masked and painted the rudder using Tamiya Sky Blue. To add some additional weathering effects around the areas of the wing and fuselage that saw a lot of action or foot traffic, I used white spirits and oil paints in a very similar fashion to how I had painted the cockpit interior. This time, however, I only used raw umber and white and focus the application on only those areas that would have seen a lot of wear. Remember, this technique is really flexible and adaptable. You can add or remove as much wear and tear as you like, and you can also change the color to give all kinds of interesting effects. When I was happy with the results, I sealed everything in with a coat of AK's Real Gauzy Gloss Surface Enhancer. It goes on smooth and is self-leveling. I've had issues in the past with future floor polish, but since I've been using AK's Real Gauzy, I haven't had any issues when applying decal softening or setting solutions over it. I like the colors on the Aeromaster sheet versus the Model Alliance sheet that I originally was planning on using so I chose to use the Aeromaster sheet instead. To get the decals to settle down to the surface, I applied a layer of AK's decal setting solution to the surface prior to and after each decal was laid down. I did have to come in and apply some Microsol to the insignias on the wings to get those particular decals to settle down over the raised surface details. With the decals laid down, I could finish building and painting a few of the ancillary bits, including the flaps and spinner. The painted surfaces on each flap were masked and then I airbrushed the natural metal leading edges using AK's Extreme Metal Aluminum. The spinner on this particular aircraft was really chipped and you can see the natural metal finish underneath. To create this effect, I coated the spinner with AK's Extreme Metal Aluminum while I had that loaded up on the airbrush for the flap leading edges. I removed the tape from each flap and installed those using Tamiya Cement. To get the well-worn chipped effect of the spinner, I added a random application of AK's chipping medium to the front part of the nose. When dry, I airbrushed it with Tamiya Sky Blue. After the blue had dried, I came back with a damp paper towel and gently wiped the spinner to remove the blue that I had applied over the chipping medium and showed the aluminum underneath. The smaller bits like the landing gear gear doors and actuators were painted and weathered in a similar fashion. To add a little more weathering to the entire model, I applied a liberal wash of AK's panel line wash. For this, I used their wash for winter camouflage. 
To me, it's better than straight black as it has a little green hue and I like the way it looks over the gray surfaces. Once dry, it is easily wiped off using a clean paper towel. For any stubborn areas, I just moisten the paper towel with a little mineral spirits and this helps remove any unwanted excess. To seal everything in and give the model an overall flat look, I applied a coat of AK's Ultra Matte Varnish. To me though, it was a little too chalky this time, so I overcoated that with a coat of Tester's Flat Enamel. To create the exhaust stains and gun streaks, I airbrushed a highly thin shade of NATO Black deck tan, and light gray in a streaking pattern using the finest settings on my Badger airbrush. To create a little extra weathering on the spinner, I cut a fine strip of Tamiya tape and applied it to the spinner to backplate joint. I then airbrushed a very light line over the rear portion of the tape. Rather than use silver or chrome for other chipping and wear effects, I instead used a lighter shade of the base color, custom mixed using Vallejo acrylics, and then highly thinned those. I used a fine tip brush to apply a random chipping pattern around the panel lines and rivets that would have seen a lot of wear. I added the landing gear using Tamiya Fine Cement and installed the exhaust stacks after painting those. To add a little extra weathering to the exhaust, I dry brushed some khaki over the stacks and then painted each exhaust with a drop of flat black. To paint the windscreen and canopy, I cut custom masks using Tamiya tape. I first sprayed a coat of interior green so that when viewed from the inside, it would match the cockpit color. I followed that up with a coat of Tamiya Ocean Gray. I weathered those pieces just like I had done with the rest of the model and applied a flat coat before removing the tape and installing them onto the model. To add the final touches, I painted the ID and formation lights first with a drop of chrome silver and then with either Tamiya clear red, green, or amber. I added the antenna mast and the two bombs to arm this little Mustang for a ground attack mission. Tamiya's 148th Mustang is a great little kit. It would have been a little simpler had I just built it out of the box and even easier if I'd remembered to modify the tail before I got into the paint stage. That being said, the kit was a real joy to build, and with that filleted tail and those RAAF markings, it really is a unique P51 variant. I hope that you enjoyed this full video build, and I hope that it inspires you to build a little Mustang of your own. I appreciate you checking out the channel once again, and be sure to subscribe if you haven't already to get the latest updates as I post new tips and tricks, as well as full build features to help you build better looking models. We'll see you next time.